My name is Jeremy, and this is Good Beer Matters. I just had this incredible creative drive to tell that story of like, Afna beer belongs everywhere. Mindful drinking means I just don't order or purchase alcoholic beer anymore because I found one to be impossible. Aficionado is the world's first professional level training and certification program for alcohol-free and non-alcoholic adult beverage. Craft beer was meant to be better, to create an artisanal experience out of flavor, history, and culture. But sometimes we overindulge and lose sight of what brought us here. My next guest reminds us that, for a great experience, mindful drinking is mandatory, but alcohol is optional. We find great experiences at the intersection of craft and culture. These are the stories of us, of great food and the beer that brings it all together. For the craft and culture of beer, this is episode 144 of Good Beer Matters with certified Cicerone and aficionado founder, Megan Anderson. Well, welcome back to the Good Beer Matters podcast. I've got my my, uh, good buddy, Megan Anderson, here today, and uh, we're going to talk about so many different things. Uh, you know, we are going to cover ground in the alcohol-free beer, but that's just the beginning. It it expands uh, uh, exponentially from there. And just the pre-conversation we had before I hit the record button is an excellent indicator that uh, we, we could go for quite some time on this, right? Megan, thank you for uh, very much for coming back to the Good Beer Matters podcast. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be back. It was an honor to hear from you. Well, I, I always, I was, I feel like every time you and I have had conversations, they've been really good conversations just because, you know, we can, we can talk about beer and those are great conversations, but whenever you and I talk about beer, it's a, it's a slightly skewed, uh, version of that beer conversation mm-hmm. that leads to another thing that leads to another thing that expands to the worlds that you and I both occupy outside of beer, which is always exciting to bring all those things I love into uh, one, one kind of conversation topic thing. It, it's a, it's a complicated thing, but it's always, always, always fun. Uh, let, let's just get everyone caught up. You've been on the podcast before, um, with, uh, Spencer Plessel, and we did a conversation about, about alcohol free. Uh, and we're going to dive into that topic a little bit deeper today, like I just mentioned, but let's just, let's get, get everyone caught up. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you are a certified Cicerone. You've worked yes. in sales. You've worked in education. Uh, you yes. recently got your MBA this year. Um, yes. you've been alcohol free for a few years. You, uh, started the aficionado certification program among other things. Uh, and you just got married a few days ago, which is, you know, <laughs> uh, that that's what everyone wants to do in their honeymoon is just, you know, get on a, <laughs> on a phone call with me. Right. Um, that's right. What have I left out about those accolades? Cause there's, there's quite a bit. Mm, no, I, I think that's, I, I've been busy. You know, I, I'd say that, for me, um, changing my relationship with alcohol was, was a personal one and definitely led to some unexpected outcomes, but all of them wouldn't have gotten me here had I not pursued that additional education, which really focused on sustainability. And there's so much application for that inside of beer that it's really unbelievable. And I know some of the things we talked about is like, how are we giving back to the industry? There's some things, exciting things there that I've been working on, but primarily, um, you know, really my focus at, in the NBA even was raising awareness around this moderation movement in the United States and kind of trying to vet with my colleagues inside and outside of the industry, of like, how big is this thing? You know, how big is this category opportunity, especially for somebody who comes from a beer background, you know, and 86% of the sales of this category right now are coming from alcohol-free and non-alcoholic, which I'll call AFNA for the rest of the program just to make it, just to reduce words and um, use a great trademark term that Dr. Keith Fia so graciously uh, suggested to me. But AFNA beer making up 86% of that category. And for me as as a sales professional and a business development executive, which is really how I've, I think I've, um, you know, made made my career off of business development for, for companies is like, how big is this opportunity and what's the strategic way we can go capture it? And uh, outside of inventing my own NA beer brand, I really p- preferred to focus on helping others grow their brands in the market using my expertise and then quickly discovered that we lacked common knowledge and education on, on this topic, which was pretty 
interesting and also funny because beer is so well studied. And um, so th- thank you for that introduction. And I would just say that, yeah, I, I, what I ended up discovering through this educational process and personal transformation and development was there's a there's a lot of room for this category to grow. And I felt best positioned to serve that need um, in my experience, uh, prior experience with the Boston Beer leading beer education for North America and um you know, f- subsequent training opportunities in the hops extract space, hemp derived beverage space, um, you know, and then non-alcoholic, uh, you know, AFNA beverage space. So yeah, it's, it, it, there's a huge opportunity. I, I've been doing a lot of talking on that topic this year about how do we make a zero our biggest asset. So I'm excited to dive into that today and hopefully um, share some good conversation and insights with one another on that topic. Well, and and I can't wait for this video to uh, come out. And I'm, not, and I'm not, as of this recording, I'm not sure the status of it, but uh, you you recently did a video with uh, Julia Hers, our, our good buddy, Julia mm-hmm. Hers, and, yes. and my co-host from the Sense of Beer Style podcast, mm-hmm. and a few other folks to talk about we can homebrew and we can turn that into uh, low alcohol or no alcohol. Um, but that's something I'm, I really want to learn how to do, if nothing else, just to take those strong beers and, you know, cut them down a little bit, mm-hmm. if, if nothing else. Um, when, uh, tell us about that experience first. Yeah. So that was a, such a cool collaboration and that really uh, happened. That was all Julia. Julia, um, as you know, is the executive di- director now of the American Homebrew Association, but has a very vast career in education and in growing, you know, with the Brewers Association and just uh, wildly curious about new things and always trying to connect and and help people. And I, I haven't actually known Julia personally very long, only maybe for about two or three years, but we just hit it off right away. We really connected at a deeply personal level and just enjoyed spending time together. She's She was part of my beta test uh, group for aficionados, as were you, Jeremy. Yeah. So appreciate, appreciate your involvement in that and helping me build a collective of professionals in the industry that could validate this information because it wasn't about me making up a bunch of information or doing research and presenting it as a certification pathway. I really thought it was important to take institutional knowledge from all over the industry and connect that into a, into a certification pathway. So we really, we really started working together, I guess, in uh, late 2021 um, on that aficionado uh, project. And then she invited me to speak at the American Homebrew Association Homebrew Con in San Diego this year in 2023, actually, uh, two days before I graduated from my MBA. So I was finishing my last assignments, <laughs> running to give my talk on uh, brewing in a beer at home, and then flying into Iowa to, to do my graduation and walk with my class, which was really cool. But Julia um, particularly saw an opportunity in NA brewing at home, A, because you don't have to play by the same parameters, but more so like if people find out about this, how can we make sure they can do it safely? So let's learn about that together. So the first was just inviting me to give a talk on sort of how to brew homebrew in a, in a beer and then um, how to do it or how to evaluate it from a sensory perspective. And so I brewed a homebrew beer for that talk. I was like, oh boy, I've actually never brewed this at home. So maybe I should do that. So I flew to Asheville, North Carolina, I had been put in contact with a great guy uh, who's in the podcast we did with Doug Piper and Julia last week. His name is Josh Brewer. That is actually his real name. Um <laughs> He has, wa- he has his fate won, was decided uh, long ago. <laughs> I, I mean, like, how could you not go into brewing, right? It's just a wonderful human being. And um, he actually won many, he won the Sam Adams homebrew competition. He's an awarded home brewer um, and he's worked at other professional breweries, including Sierra Nevada, uh, Mother Earth. Um, he worked at uh, a couple different, a couple different brewing startups. And now with his wife, Shannon, is starting a uh, a new brewery called Brewwell, and the focus is actually on yoga, meditation, and making great, uh, you know, German style beers, as well as uh, low and having low and no offerings oh, to. That accommodate. sounds like such a great day. <laughs> Tell me, this like this is you would you are going to have to be like like customer number one, you know, because yeah. this is like it's so up your alley. But anyway, I got a hold of him through a friend. He wanted to take on the challenge. He had a really great, a really really nice uh, SS Brewtech setup. And we decided to go ahead and attempt brewing a homebrew. So we, we did the research together. We wrote a recipe um, called uh, MJ, Megan and Josh's NAIPA. Um, we had failures. We had laughter. We had a lot of fun. And actually, that first brew was the one where Mark um, goal, 
about the culture of over drinking because he wanted to come see okay, people yeah. brewing NA and that generated this good beer hunting article that I was mentioned in. And my understanding is uh, from that conversation, Mark was awarded an international uh, journalism award uh, for that uh, through the, uh, the brewing uh, journalist uh, Institute. Uh, I can't remember what, I'm sure you you were awarded an award there too. I think. For are, your- are you thinking the uh, the uh, North American Guild of Beer Writers? That is it. All he right. received an uh, an award, a best in class award for that article. Yeah, and my did. understanding is that article is the number one read article on good beer hunting of this year and a top ten of all time, which I think speaks to the idea that we're people wanted are, are curious about this movement. It generated this awesome homebrew that I ended up taking to homebrew con. People tasted it. There were great people there. I'm thinking about Keith Lemke from Seabull was like in line when I walked up, you know, and he's, he's always been a really fun person to bounce ideas off of. And he, you know, is the first to call out when he doesn't think something is authentic to beer. And he came and listened to my talk and gave me some just beautiful compliments on how he thought that this was really great information and valid. And Julia tasted the beer. She's like, uh, yeah, I got to learn how to make this. So we all got back together two weeks ago in Asheville. Doug Piper came because Keith Via had told him about um, the program. And so, so he brought us all together uh, along with someone from the homebrew club in Asheville. And so we brewed the beer. We actually missed our gravity that day. So we ended up with a beer. My understanding is as of today, this beer is sitting at about 1.2% ABV. So now we get to write about why that happens. We used two yeast packets this time instead of one. And changed our dry hopping regimen. So I imagine we got some hop creep uh, from that and had some additional yeast that actually caused that. But this is what makes it fun is like, you know, we don't have to play by the same rules as of like what makes AFNA beer 0.0 or under 0.5 as a home brewer. But what what means quality and what means safety was really the focus. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we found out so many things that we couldn't even answer during that exercise. So I think what we're finding is there's a lot of opportunity to be able to teach this material and become very good at it. And there's actually a few groups out there that are homebrewing a lot of NA beer in Australia. Uh, and the, the interest is growing. Actually, that evening, I was asked to come to the Malt Rangers um, uh, like homebrewing club meeting. And there were 40 people there that came to learn about brewing NA beer at home. And it was just amazing. I mean, I never thought in my life I would see home brewers. I mean, you could see the skeptics in the audience, but they, they were curious. And we did a sampling of some athletic beers, and I brought a bunch of things for them to taste. I did some sensory spiking on some compounds found commonly in any beer, particularly methionol, which gives that warty character. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could see them understanding. I mean, I'm telling them, I'm like, methionol is a Strecker aldehyde. It is not odor active in ethanol. So then I poured a regular beer into this spiked glass and it, it immediately the, that potato character disappeared. Interesting. And, they, and they're starting to get it. Oh, this is maybe why I didn't like NA beer before, but now I can learn to work around this challenge knowing that it comes from malt. So it was just a very great day. And I think Julia's entire intention of this is let's put on the table what the challenges are of brewing a great tasting home brewer. How can we do it safely? And let's start to provide some education because this can drive more interest in home brewing well, and for when, certain people. And, yeah. and when you look at the the whole home brewing movement uh, that you know, I've been home brewing since 2007, and it's just you see that you know people want to brew stronger beers than they can get at home, or or that was just the the net effect of like oh you know everyone's you can go out and buy a 6% IPA. Well, I want a 7% IPA with, or I want to, I want to do it my way, or I want, or then you get those people who are like competition junkies and they want to learn how to <laughs> just nail every style. You know, the, the Jamil uh, Zinashev's uh, acolytes, you know, they, they want to be able to hit every style perfectly and just get awards. And, and so there's this, there's this hunger. You can see those people mm-hmm. who are really into home brewing. It becomes yep an identity. It becomes a, a thing. It's like, you know, uh, you know, my mother makes quilts and they're incredible quilts. She sells these <laughs> quilts and, and they're incredible pieces of, uh, of art. But then you have these people who take home brewing to that same degree. It seems like this is the next frontier of how do you make that amazing beer that you created or that style that you've absolutely nailed? And how do you take that and turn it into a small beer or an NA beer and still have it taste 
pretty darn close to the the normal thing. And that seems to be the 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 next big challenge that is just emerging now with the work that you're doing and with the work that you, you've done with Julia. It's just as a home brewer, you know, I, I've I've got a tropical American brown in my garage right now, and and I, when I don't want to open another beer, I just go and just get half a glass, and I'll drink that. Oh, that was good. I go get another half a glass. Oh, that was mm-hmm. good. Go get another half a glass because it's there. It's in a keg. It's easy. Next, mm-hmm. you know, oh, I've had a little bit more than I wanted to. Mm-hmm. If we if we can learn to brew smaller beers when we want to, when we want mm-hmm. to create that, then then we can kind of put the control back where it needs to be in, in our hands. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's a very interesting concept that, that this alcohol free movement and this low alcohol mm-hmm. movement is really starting to uh, emerge as we can have our flavor, we can have our experience, but we can have our control too. And that's something that we've kind mm-hmm. of lost over the past few decades that I've, I've witnessed. Oh, that's such a good point. You know, I didn't really expect that being such a focus of a conversation in this homebrew meeting, but it was. I mean, when I wasn't doing education, people were making comments and even uh, Chris Fee, Chris uh, Chris Frey, who was the, the head of the, their group, you know, talked about this is why he wanted to learn. He was like, I'm retired now. And I was finding that every night became a Friday night. And I, I just, I, I was just really, you know, um, impressed with a level of openness and sharing from a group of home experienced homebrewers on this. It, it kind of tied into Mark's article from, from Good Beer Hunting, right? Which is like, it's kind of part of the culture. It's sort of some of the known risk. And when your identity is tied to being a really good, great brewer and conquering every style, I mean, I think those are just reasons, even more reasons why, you know, Afna beer should have a place either on our homebrew schedule or in our refrigerator because this just allows us to keep doing what we enjoy. And to me, it's all about being able to drink more beer. I think this is a really healthy opportunity for the category. And um, I also want to mention before I forget that you bring up a good point when you talk about brewing things that taste like the real thing. Because what I'm noticing now is some of the strongest growth growth coming from brands are like Corona Zero, Guinness, Dos Equis. These are they they're putting their name on them for a reason. They're trying to create flavor analog, right? And that's another reason why I think we're it were perfectly primed for this category to explode um, in in craft Afna beer because the technology now exists through the forms of oils and extracts that are natural, as well as brewing and dealkalization technology that's available at a smaller scale and biological methods of brewing in a beer, all of which combine to allow Samuel Adams, who probably never imagined of brewing in any beer to, to, you know, be considering testing any beer on draft like athletic. They see the, they see the market opportunity and they're preparing response to Sierra Nevada, Deschutes. Um, these are companies that are very open and to say that we, we have to participate in this category and they're not doing it by making up a new style of NA uh, akin to what, you know, Budweiser did when they created O'Doul's and yeah. made a new type of NA beer. They're saying, no, this is a Sam Adams. This is a Sierra Nevada. This is a Corona. This is a Deschutes. This yeah, is a brew dog. You know? it, it, and they're so proud the of it. They're it. putting their name on it, not yes. creating a separate name that appears to Correct. be different. Right. And, yes. and you turned me on to Heineken zero and I've been uh, drinking a bunch of those, uh, the, the Guinness zero, you've mentioned the, the Black Butte, uh, from Deschutes, their NA beer, uh, and, and I've, got, in fact, I've got some of that uh, uh, Sam Adams uh, hazy in my cooler right now. Oh. The, the you know zero alcohol, in all of those beers. Um, you know, granted, I've spent a lot of time with beer. I, I've trained. I've I've passed fancy exams, and I've trained mm-hmm. my palate and all that sort of stuff. These are beers that, especially if I'm not really paying attention, if I'm just drinking, I would never even notice. If I were paying very close attention, I might notice that something was slightly different but I would quickly get over it if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, wh- whatever. <laughs> and keep drinking yeah. like, Hey man, God, I- I'm having a great day. I could drink all day long. Man, I feel like I'm 18 again. <laughs> you know? And <laughs> This is what I do, Jeremy. This is what I do beginning at 8am. Like it, that's the reality of this is zeros. Don't, don't have to be perceived as lacking. These add 
tremendous amount of occasions to our beer drinking regimens, including morning meetings. I think it helps just sort of create that environment of, of social interaction with people. I've just noticed, I just bring them. I don't care. I throw them in my backpack. I bring them to meetings and I'm like, they're no, I took a Heineken zero on a Southwest flight recently that had a big sticker on there that said no alcoholic beverages allowed on board. Do not. And I went right up to the attendant. I was like, well, this is really strange because this beverage actually says on the side here that it's a non-alcoholic beverage. And she goes, well, I guess you're right. Go ahead. And so I took my Heineken Zero on the plane and everyone's like jealous. They're like, I wish we had that here. So I see the demand and the interest growing because to your point, um, yes, why they are different. I mean, because you are, you don't have ethanol in there, which we know as somebody who's passed a lot of exams like you have, you know the flavor impact yeah. that, that that's going to have. And also the solubility, uh, the solubility nature of ethanol and some of the other uh, you know attributes that it, like warming, for example, that it contributes. But minus those things, these technologies have allowed us to capture all the other flavors of fermentation and put those back into the, into the brew. And I think that's where, you know, folks like us can learn to enjoy a Heineken zero, although slightly different from a, a traditional Heineken, um, you know, at more occasions during the day. Yeah. And so let, let I, I've got a, a kind of a big question I want to ask you, but let's just set the scene real quick. I mean, you, you, you are alcohol, sure. you are, uh, completely dry, alcohol free. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm still a drinker. In fact, I've admitted to you in, in the past that there are still times when I abuse alcohol, especially on a Friday night and I've got a barley wine, I've got a, this, I've got a, that. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it, it's a day after Thanksgiving and like, you know, I'm not going anywhere. So I might have an extra, and, and, and that's, and that's my choice. But the reality is, is my identity is only partially in the beer industry. I'm also, uh, uh, kind of a, excuse me, a, a revived older athlete. I'm a coach. I, I work mm -hmm. in, uh, do some uh, aquatic work and, and, uh, and all that stuff as well, as well as, you know, other jobs and everything else. So beard's only part of what I do. So it's, it's no longer serves me to come home and have, a couple beers and just a little bit extra and just a little bit extra more mm -hmm. that, 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 that's not the life that I want. I want, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm one of those people that, you know, I don't believe in diets. I, I understand that works for some. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, you just got, you just got married. A lot of people think, well, I'm going to go on a diet. So I look amazing on my <laughs> wedding day and for the photos, right? Great. If that's your thing, right on. That's not my thing. My thing is I want I want something that I can sustain for the long haul. If that means, um, if that means I don't eat, uh, 10 cookies on a daily basis, then maybe I have one, you know, you know, that, that's kind of, that's, that's my approach to all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm still going to have a beer, but there are times when I'm today, I'm going to be an athlete tomorrow. I'm going to be a coach. The next day I'm going to be a beer guy. The day after that, who knows? It's nice to have options for these occasions. It's nice to have a specific tool for a specific job, right? Yep. And so where I'm going with this is, is we, especially these days in the uh, traditional beer industry, uh, you, you get uh, people with their, uh, like me with their fancy certifications, like, oh, it's all about the experience and the glassware and the food pairing. I am one of those people. I'm guilty of that. And it, because it's amazing. I want, I, you know, whether you can taste this off flavor or not great. I want the experience, a great beer, a great plate of food can be an incredible experience. Talk to me about your perspective on how NA and low alcohol options can still facilitate that experience or even a different experience. Oh, I love that. And I remember you talking about this with John Walker on a previous episode, you, you know, and I love, I mean, I love that you kind of own this group of nerds, like that. We're just <laughs> like, yeah, we take this like a oh, little too far. Like, I, I'm super you know, ridiculous. About, I know. Yeah, we get it. We can make beer a very, you know, for most people, a very, uh, you know, bland, yellow, fizzy for a long time beverage. That a lot of people didn't put a thought into the, to the most scientific, sensory oriented discussions, you know, and then on, on top of it, tell you about some food that, you know, you must have with it to get that experience. So I get it like that. That's cool. And I, I, I think I really appreciated John's answer. And he's like, I don't really know if it's going to become 
fancy or not. I don't think that really matters, but I think it will, it will develop its own culture just naturally by the demand that people have for it. And I think, so yeah, for me personally, mindful drinking means I just don't order or purchase um, alcoholic beer anymore because moderation for me, which you're kind of alluding to, that's the one cookie versus 10. I, I found one to be impossible. And there is a body of growing body of evidence that for a certain amount of the population, for on various factors, moderation with um, you know alcohol use can be almost impossible because it, because of its addictive characteristics and that affects each individual differently. So I love that you began this by talking about really what Derek Brown has brought to the to the AFNA world, which is the principles of mindful drinking, because that's really what this comes down to. Yeah. And so to, to me being a utopian visionary of sorts, you know, and coming out of this ch- transformation related to me applying mindful drinking principles to my own life, which really it just equi- it was equivalent to like, I don't, I don't drink alcoholic beer anymore. I can sample it for sensory purposes in a plastic cup, in a white room. And, um, and I go on with my day, but I do not purchase it at lunch or dinner. I drink Afna beer now. And because of that, I just was inspired and just had this incredible creative drive to tell that story of like, Afna beer belongs everywhere. And here's all these new occasions you can enjoy it in because we're not encumbered by the same challenges as alcoholic beer due to the three tier system, due to the law of like where you can take alcoholic beverages. So why not? begin to suggest that any beer for me as an athlete also i like orange theory i don't know if you've ever been to an orange theory fitness but that's like my jam i i you know i'm gonna run a sub seven minute mile by my 42nd birthday which is something i couldn't have done in my previous lifestyle but now not only can i do that i can drink an afna beer as a recovery drink because in 2014 in munich there's a paper published on this npr wrote an article about it as well it keeps surfacing on the internet but they actually gave non-alcoholic beer as a recovery drink to Olympic athletes in the 2014 Olympics and noted the, the increases in performance because nutritionally speaking, I think there's a lot of research to be done still to make that claim that Afna beer is healthy for us. And so not only do I see that, but connecting it to those occasions. So that's, you know, that's an amazing opportunity then to just say breakfast time is a great occasion for me to drink a Guinness point zero with my, you know, eggs and kale. And yeah. why, why wouldn't we look at that as new, as nutritionally valuable, but also a way to socially connect, you know, recently, I'll just give another example. Recently I gave a, uh, a not an AFNA, uh, dinner pairings, drinks and dinner pairings for a fundraiser in New York City at the Edison Hotel. The entire Sesame Street or a a great deal of the Sesame Street actors were there because this particular fundraiser was for an organization that serves children that have medical needs in New York State. So it's called the Docs for Tots. So it's pediatricians and social workers that get that basically help families in need because they don't have access to, to good health care. And these are people not only in their own careers, but with the communities they serve, they see the impact of alcohol if it's misused and those mindful drinking principles are not being applied. So the purpose of me being there was to open their eyes to the idea that there's a $55 bottle, dollar bottle of beautiful Afna Pinot Noir that you can pair with your steak. And there's this wonderful 0.0 pills called atmosphere made in Brooklyn by, a, you know, imported by a, and designed in Brooklyn produced. Or your life is very stressful because yeah. there's a, co- a COVID outbreak. So I just saw the audience beginning to like, they were with me they were just tasting these things. They're like, this tastes good. I never would have tried this. I never would have considered it or bought it because to me coming to a dinner means you drink alcohol. Yeah. So by doing this, it was a a way to demonstrate that we can begin to think differently about those principles and creating occasions that are just in some ways, just as good, if not better, because you have the ability to consume more. You're not restricting yourself in that regard. Well, and and this is a a great uh, conversation we're having because, uh, well, a little bit of background, and you know this, but anyone watching or listening, um, I'm an um, amateur student of human performance. I mean, as a former athlete uh, in college, nothing professional, was never that good. 
but as a as someone who kind of pursues athleticism and and and, and human performance in other areas th- this is one of those things that I, i'm in, i'm interested in especially you talked about the uh, the olympic athletes in 2014 and you know we could talk about the B12 vitamins. We could talk about the what all the components in there that that add to your body, but we're also talking about your mind, right? We're we're mm-hmm. you know you 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 can't play sports or dance or music or anything that you do. You can't do it well when your mind is disengaged. That's like you know we're eating healthy, but it's just a, a kale with olive oil and a bun- and a dozen uh, hard boiled eggs. I mean, h- how fun is that? It's not. So what we need to consider is while we're fueling the body, we also have to fuel our mind. We also have to fuel our spirit to get to that performance state. And anyone who uh, is listening or watching, anyone who's ever been a higher level athlete or musician or whatever it is, anyone who's ever experienced that flow state, you know exactly what I'm talking about to get into that peak performance state. And what I wonder, especially with those athletes and you talk about this pairing dinner. Uh, you know, I know people who don't drink alcohol for religious reasons, for athletic reasons, for uh, family history reasons, for uh, economic reasons. There's there's a dozens of reasons why people would not drink, but you can still put together that experience. You can still put together the flavors of things that pair well together, things that enliven your soul, your soul, things that facilitate conversation and communion with other people, whether they're like-minded or not, whether they look like you or not, but just to facilitate that conversation and to get into that, that performance and that relational peak performance state. Alcohol is not necessary. It is not required. It is a helpful tool in some of those situations but it's not necessary. We can do it in other ways. And you just talked about that beautifully. Uh, I think this is a, an important concept that we need to get out into the world is you, you can satiate your sweet tooth. You don't need a 10th cookie. You can satiate, you, you can satiate your, your need to disconnect. You don't need a 12% barley wine. You know, there's, there are tools out there. There are options and you, you have control over your experience. So I'm, it's a power to the people type of situation. (laughs) You know, I love that. And when I, you know, we wrote a book, when I created Aficionado, we knew right away we needed to write a book on Afnabir. There'd never been one written before. So we, we wrote a 150 page manual, really learning manual on everything from the history of small beer and non-alcoholic beer post-prohibition that also covered topics like how does alcohol affect your brain mm-hmm. and the body, like alcohol and your health. Um, and then we uh, wrote about the principles of mindful drinking. So we really, because to your point, like we wanted to this, the entire purpose when I thought of like, why am I doing this? Why am I going to risk starting a business in a post COVID world in an un, in an unknown category that hasn't really, that it's by many companies standards in the U S isn't really worth focus yet but I'm, I'm, I'm banking on where I've already seen it work. And it's in cultures that embrace blending of these two con- concepts, which really comes back down to like beer is such a, you know, look at Germany and Spain, like where it's, it's over 12% of the market because they're beer cultures, right? So they're saying to us by non-alcoholic beer, they're being over 10% of the market is we're drinking our beer and still enjoying it, but we're having the one cookie, And then we're switching to, but you don't have to even give up any of those pleasures. I mean, to me, it's like, so getting to eat 10 cookies, but only having the impact to your health of one. And if anything, you're getting some vitamins in those cookies too, and some other benefits. And it still acts as that social lubricant because, you know, quite frankly, people nowadays have the option with cannabis, the legalization of cannabis to choose an alcohol replacement. Mm -hmm. If they so desire, even in the form of beverage, it's one of the fastest growing categories right now is hemp derived beverage. You could look at a market like Minnesota where it can be sold in a craft tap room, a THC drink right next to alcohol, which is kind of unbelievable that that is happening right now in the U.S. Um, And the reality is we have the technology to allow people to choose how they want to experience um, themselves relaxing or being social. And beverage itself is the tool, right? Nobody 
in the cannabis world, nobody goes to each other's house to split a gummy is what I heard somebody say one time, right? <laughs> they, you go and you drink with your friends and you bring the bottle to share and you sit and have a session with your friends while you talk out the, the challenges of your life in this world. And I think that's where these Afna products play a very important role in those occasions. You bring up another uh, part of the experience that, um, you, uh, well, so a previous guest, uh, Dr. T Ted Slingerland, uh, came on, uh, and I'll have all this in the show notes, but he came on and he talked about, he wrote a book on our culture, civilization, and our inherent human need to get drunk. And not a, and not just our human need, we've observed, we, I had no part of it, uh, people smarter, much smarter than I, have uh, have also observed a uh, certain few or a few animals seeking out that rotting fruit that was that had mm -hmm. extra caloric value, if you know what I mean. One of the things that he talked about uh, within our, you know, uh, well, uh, uh, well studied need to get high, get altered, get drunk, get to get ourselves to uh, either check out or to get us to a very uh, creative state. Um, we know a lot of famous musicians and actors who kind of get themselves to that perfect little state. It's like, I, I, I forget which musician it was, but they said, you know, uh, there's something to the fact of, um, you know, I, I'm not ready to go on stage until I've had one shot. And then I'm, I'm just like perfect. And then I'm in that perfect state of just funny. Uh, and I forget who said that, but that, but that's a common thing is I, I want to get myself to that, that space, whatever that space is, whatever the motivation is. And that's part of this experience. That's part of relating to each other. That's part of that social lubricant of, of, uh, I, I can shed my day. I can shed my fears. I can shed my anxieties with, uh, with a good double IPA. And next thing you know, I'm talking to everyone at the bar and we're best friends forever <laughs> for at least the next two hours. <laughs> but when we're talking no alcohol, how does that change that dynamic? Um, and you mentioned it, it still serves that tool. And, and I, of course I know my own answer to this, but it serves, it serves that purpose, but it's a, it's a different mechanism. It's a different thing. Can you unpack that as, as far as you understand it? Yeah. You know, I'd say like, I look at other substances in our society, like coffee, for example, yeah. like some people have sensitivities to you. Like we don't think twice about saying, do you want regular decaf? Right. Like you're still getting to have a warm cup of coffee and, relax and like experience the benefits of that, whatever it may be to you. For a lot of people, it's just the feeling of what I do when I wake up to get my day started. Mm -hmm. But as we, as we evolve in our life and maybe our physiology evolves and our consciousness evolves, we understand that some of these things at all or in excess can be, um, have negative impact to our performance, to our health, to, you know, to maybe with, maybe standing in the way of helping us achieve that one really big thing so that light can help us get that creative flow started Certainly, I think there's examples of how in society we've we've created alternatives for people to either maybe choose to blend, like if you're going to have a, a lot of something, or choose to abstain for something for one reason for another, but still seek and desire that substitute because it goes back to – there's been many books written, really great books actually just written on the impact of beverage on human society. Mm. Um, I think there's a, a great book that I read when I was teaching at Boston Beer called Seven Drinks That Saved the World. And it goes through coffee and tea and wine and beer and like each of those historical contexts. I mean, I think it's also safe to say historically, well, yeah, maybe there are uh, examples of, of other mammals seeking out, um, you know, fruit that had been fermented. But we can't really say why, you know, what, is it the caloric component, you know, is you know, realistically speaking, historically, and you know this from your training, is that we had to drink alcohol to survive. And yeah. as a matter of fact, human humans sort of evolved and adapted as a result of that, because as we began to live in these more agrarian uh, and urban sort of living situations, especially into medieval times, the water supplies were not reliable for human consumption. So really, uh, it required a certain amount of ethanol to be present in our diets to prevent us from getting sick and dying. And there's many examples of cholera outbreaks that we can look at in uh, in the in the UK, historically documented to talk about the the impact of that. I mean, you can even go back into like biblical references of like drink the wa the wine, not the water, but don't get drunk, yep. right? Like there's there's these uh, this advice being given to us for over two millennia and, and across many different 
you know, belief systems, scriptures, health models to say like, there was a need for this. And I think, uh, you know, that need also became, you know, we got, people got together to drink because you had to go to the source where it was being created or made. And it was also a currency. And so for all those reasons, we fast forward into modern times, which to your point, it's no longer a necessary ingredient, but we are belief systems of what it does for us. You know, that's, those are hard, those are hard, um, challenges to overcome when it's such a subjective experience. If a person truly believes that a couple of beers makes them more creative, and actually I'll, I'll say, you should add this to the show notes, Dr. Andrew Huberman in the Stanford Labs did a really great, two great segments I would recommend to your listeners. I think they'd be interested in one's called Alcohol, Your Body and Your Brain, which I think is a really, really good, good episode. I believe it's one of the most downloaded podcasts of all time last year. And he what, did another one. On- what I'm sorry, what is the podcast? It's Dr. Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab, and Huberman it's called Lab, Alcohol. Right. Yep, it's called Your Alcohol, uh, Your Body, and Your Brain, I believe. And it's like a three-hour-long, long-form episode that's all about the biology of how alcohol impacts us, history. And I don't think the listeners will be super happy to hear what his recommended amount of alcohol <laughs> intake for, for ideal health is. But but that's not for me to – that's not what aficionado is about. You know, for us, yeah. we're really about to educate on the opportunity, but – the, the, the medical evidence is a little hard to ignore, but he also talks about the same belief system with things like substances like cannabis. Like people truly believe that doing this makes them more creative. And the reality is there definitely appears to be a more spiritual element to that creativity. And just it's hard once humans believe something. It's that bias exists, right? So like, oh, every time I do this, I feel more creative. Well, of course you do because you're changing your consciousness, which means the focus that you have on certain aspects in your worldviews changes, mm-hmm. which allows for those that neuroplasticity and those neural pathways, which is a whole other topic of discussion to be activated. And then you may feel more creative as a result of that, especially when you're being social because it makes yeah. you feel happy because yeah. we're happy when we're around people. Yeah. Well, and, and there's something, something to be said for that too. Again, uh, from a, uh, a human performance standpoint, um, you know, I, I wake up and I drink espresso every morning and that's how I, that's how I begin my day. Uh, but on those occasions when I'm traveling, I'm staying some hotel that's got crappy coffee. Well, I don't know if you know this, Megan, but I'm a raging snob when it comes to beverages. Um, and so if all I've got is crappy hotel coffee, then you know what? I'm going to go without because I just, I just can't. I can't, it tastes so awful that it, it makes me grumpy. It puts me in a bad mood. It ruins mm-hmm. my day because it tastes awful. But you know what? Those days when I go without my morning coffee, when you know what? My day still starts. I still get moving. Everything starts working eventually, you know? Uh, uh, you know. Uh, so I know from experience that I prefer to have my little espresso in the morning. It helps me prime the pump is what I tell myself. <laughs> but when I don't have that, it all works. It's all just fine. Mm-hmm. Um, you, we can go out and, and by extension, this would go to, Hey, we're going to go out. We're going to be the life of the party. You could still do that without alcohol. Alcohol mm-hmm. does not create something that doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Alcohol just opens the door a little bit wider. So that which already exists can sneak through a little bit quicker. Same thing mm-hmm. with, with coffee. Uh, we, uh, we talk about, uh, uh, again, human performance. And part of that is the ritual. It's not mm-hmm. the drink. It's not the caffeine. It's not the alcohol. It's the ritual. And you talk mm-hmm. to any athlete, any performing artist, anyone who who has to get themselves into a peak performance state. Talk to Taylor Swift. She knows, you know, it, it's <laughs> before this event, if you do these same things in sequence to to activate your brain, then you're going to get to that performance state. And, and please forgive me for being crude, mm-hmm. but I mean, that's kind of what foreplay is for as well, to, to get you to that peak performance state mm-hmm. with your loved one. Mm-hmm. It's all kind of the same thing. Mm-hmm. Espresso, beer, whatever it may be, just kind of helps, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't hinder when it's not there. Would you agree? I think. I think you're nailing it. I mean, I, I, I'd go on to say Dr. Huberman does a lot of podcasts on human creativity and how to stimulate it because for that exact reason, he's very interested in the things that we ingest and put in our body and how that affects us. And I've learned a lot from his podcast because he actually says exactly that. And there's some really even good in the realm of 
becoming, you know, exploring or being sober curious or Cali sober, like looking at that movement. You know, Annie Grace wrote a book called This Naked Mind, which is one of the first books I read when I was still drinking, but I was very curious about sobriety and mm-hmm. thinking, wondering if I, if I could do it and be successful at living that way. And she really just went right after those rituals. Like, here's what you believe these rituals do for you. Here's the reality why you may feel that way, which is why when you become sober, you should still go do all of these things and enjoy your life because it's actually these other impacts of being with people and having meaningful conversation and generative discussion. But we do it with a drink in hand because to your point, we take pleasure in that. That's part of our ritual and we should we should seek to do that. And now we have the tools available to us. And I think what we're just experiencing is just a latent acceptance that like, oh, Alcohol was just always a part of my ritual, but what you're saying is it's actually not good for me, so I should be more mindful about how I adopt that into these situations, and how is it, I think everybody who's at least I've talked to who's curious about sobriety, that's one of their first questions is like, how do you do it? How do you go out? How do you travel? And Mm -hmm. and how do you... Well, you know, at first it was, what I think I noticed was like how many missed opportunities there were for that occasion for a non-alcoholic beverage that wasn't water an energy drink soda you know uh or coffee to be consumed in that place when there's these other non-alcoholic analogs that still have a premium price tag attached to them that's that's that kind of was very evident to me so yeah i would totally agree with you i we're very when you think about performance consciousness i think a lot of it ties back to the rituals in terms of like how our worldview develops and we just happen to live in a culture and society that puts a lot of emphasis on alcohol being the vehicle to enjoy those rituals. And that's just more and more evidence. And I, I liked, I like science. So I like to read the studies, seeing how that is actually when applied in cohorts, you know, impacting people's overall health and well-being. And I'll give an example. There was a study in Japan that was just um, that was just cited. I really like this Victoria Waters and Dry Atlas. She's doing a newsletter on AFNA and like what's happening in the industry. And she posted this study about in Japan, they gave a cohort of, of people suffering from alcoholism and alcohol use disorder. They just gave them analog replacements of those beverages in an AFNA, AF and NA format. Mm-hmm. And it, redu- it reduced um, by a significant percentage helped people just transform their relationship with alcohol. And then they went on without a relapse of overconsumption to the point of needing to be hospitalized or having these other issues associated with it, which told me that um, we get stuck in these loops and habits and rituals, which which without exploring what what it's like to go a morning without an espresso and see that you're actually going to be okay. And that you actually might find that day you tried a smoothie or another juice or you you actually, because you just enjoy beverage so much and it's such a part of your ritual, you can look for another opportunity to substitute in this case, um, another beverage. And if you look at the AFNA category and the the description of the consumer, which is something I'm also very interested in, is how do we market? How do we market these beverages? How do we create this market to grow this into a $25 billion plus category in, in North America? And I think that part of that is knowing that the majority of these consumers are the people that are exactly like you. I'm actually only like 22% of the of the group, right? People that abstain. The rest of people are still drinking alcohol. They're just trying to say, I don't drink alcohol Monday through Friday. Or mm-hmm. when I sit down and drink with my friends, I have my one Imperial IPA and then I switch to the NAs. And, that, and I'm hearing that adoption of that ritual happen now and people aren't losing their happiness or they wouldn't be doing it and the category wouldn't be growing. So I think we're starting to see evidence that not only in the cases where alcohol may be having a negative impact, but just in regular everyday use, there's still a lot of pleasure to be had. And I think that, that that's a, a really good way of looking well, at it. And there's, there's kind of an old adage, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, where they say, well, okay, if we're going to go out and we know we're going to be drinking, then make sure the first thing you drink is really, really good because then you won't yes. care, right? You know, that type of thing. And, and that's not to say that, you know, uh, make a judgment on quality uh, from one thing to the other, but what a fantastic move that is for those people like me who still drink, but you know, I'm a father now. I'm, I'm a, I, 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 the story I tell myself is, um, is, uh, I, I'm still an athlete. I'm a coach and, and I do, and I do these things. So, okay. How about I go and I have 
one good beer. And then after that, I have some NA beers that are also good, that I also enjoy, and they and they help create this great experience. But I can drive home. <laughs> In fact, I'll I'll give all y'all a ride, you know, uh, because yes. I, I I really don't I I don't want to leave uh, after all you guys are on the road. So how about you all just pile my car? I'll drop you off, and then I'll see you in the morning, and I'll I'll come bang on your door extra loud just because it's funny. Um, <laughs> uh, it's it it's stuff like that that. Um, it, I'm sorry, I forget where I was going to go with that. It was it was going to be extremely profound and witty, but uh, but I lost it. But it, it's one of those things where where it just it does serve a purpose, whether you are completely alcohol free or yep. completely pro alcohol that I am and always have been, and probably if I'm honest, will always will be. But uh, but just understanding that um, we have control, but. You you, you uh, brought up uh, AFNA, uh, officially called aficionado, and I, I want to make sure while we still have some time that we cover that ground as well. So tell us about aficionado, a.k.a. AFNA. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so aficionado is the world's first professional level training and certification program for alcohol-free and non-alcoholic adult beverage, which for us, those verticals encompass um, AFNA beer which is our first vertical that's available now. So if you're listening to Good Beer Matters, you probably like beer and you should go to alcoholfreeaficionados.com and check out um, our training vertical. So we actually have a training course in there that you can go through, which has slides and videos of me explaining basically all the information that we compiled. Um, There's a syllabus you can access that helps you study for an an AFNA beer certified uh, distinction, which Jeremy, you hold. So you, you you know about this. So it's an online test you can take that's perfect for any maker, distributor, retailer, um, or media person, or just an, an individual enthusiast around these beverages to up their knowledge game around everything from the history of Afna beer to um, production methods, sensory, um, how to read the label, regulatory, to the, the, how does it affect your health, and how do you how do you appropriately sell and serve? So we don't necessarily do anything that the other training programs do. We really attack this from a totally different angle and focus on what makes af- uh, alcohol-free and non-alcoholic beer, in this case, different from its alcoholic counterparts. And that was differentiated enough to create this platform, so much so that we are going to create uh, additional verticals. And I'm starting to write the AFNA wine certified um, program right now with some uh, non-alcoholic winemakers actually in the U S as well as a program called can a connoisseur, which will be for hemp derived and marijuana derived beverage. And then finally an AFNA spirits vertical will follow to talk about alcohol free and non-alcoholic spirits. So the point was, Looking at this being a, uh, you know, what I have deemed to be in total in its totality in a seven-year maturity curve about a thirty-five billion dollar um, total AFNA category again encompassing AF and NA beer, hemp-derived beverage, AF and NA wine, AF and NA spirits, and RTDs. Um, you know, in the next seven years, we'll, we're at one percent of the category now, or a billion dollars. So yeah. we have a long ways to go. So those um, cohorts that I mentioned in this ecosystem of service need to level up their knowledge so that they can better spot opportunity. And there's already hundreds of SKUs available because the demand online is there. Now they have to make their way into the marketplace and um, and find adoption at traditional retail, especially in the on-premise, which we're really seeing suffering right now, particularly on draft and craft beer numbers are down because consumption patterns have changed. So um, at the AFNA Beer Certified Platform really serves to meet that need. Um, we just recently were featured in a Brewbound article. We have uh, signed an engagement with BrewDog, who takes this category very seriously. They've had over, um, over 500% growth in their AF variety pack. And we're one of the first craft um, non-alcoholic offerings that were available. It, it's kind of funny how they made it. It was like a joke. It was like James Watts joke of like making the strongest beer in the world. And everyone got kind of pissed off about that. So then he went and made a beer called Nanny State, which had what's 0.5% and people went nuts over it. And it actually mm-hmm. sold a lot of it and there was demand. So he's like, Oh geez, I guess we have to make this now. Yep. Well, in the U.S., they open source their recipe. They make it in a very sustainable way. I was aware of this when I was selling hops. So I met them, met their brewers, started making some NA beers with them. 
signed a deal with them. So they're actually taking this Afna Beer certified program all across the U.S. to their distributors and their retailers, including uh, Mary Guyver's team at Whole Foods and Shannon's team at Total Wine, who are very focused right now in this category and looking for opportunities to level up their knowledge base for their team so that they can better serve that consumer, which is really the purpose of creating this program was to empower people. So aficionado in a nutshell is just the first of its kind that doesn't compete with Cicerone. It doesn't compete with WSCT. It doesn't compete with the SOM program. It complements. It's meant to, it complements. It complements. Yes. And to, and to refer people back to those programs that they need more specific style training, for example. But what we really want to do is close the gap in knowledge between that that AFNA offering and those alcoholic counterparts. And this is interesting because we've spent a lot of time talking about the, uh, the experience, you know, leaning into, because for me, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? This is, this is why we have a um, hundred billion dollar beer industry is because of the experience, because of all that. Uh, There's a couple things I want to pull out of this, what you just said though. And, and, and please correct me if I've got this wrong, but uh, but for all of you who are like, okay, yeah, experience, you're you're just a fancy Cicerone. All you care about is food pairing and fancy glass where it's sticking out your pinky. Guilty of all of that. But if you're business oriented, if, you, if you're someone who thinks about, well, I need to move these widgets from point A to point B so everyone gets paid, that's perfectly wonderful as well. We all love to get paid. This is, the number I looked up is in 2020, it was a $17.5 billion industry, just the NA uh, stuff. Your numbers are almost double that uh, currently. This is a billion dollar industry, billion with a B industry. And so if we want to do a better job to turn that into a $100 billion industry uh, or be a part of this $30 billion industry, we should know about it. We should know our product. Call me old fashioned, but if I'm going to sell something, I should know my product. And 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 just just for a little frame of reference, everyone is losing their minds over Taylor Swift. I think she's wonderful, but this is way bigger than Taylor Swift. I brought her up earlier. I got to bring her up again. This is way bigger than Taylor Swift. This NA stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. So when we go out to educate people on stuff, there's a few different myths that people still have in their mind. And and, and I'm going to, I'm just going to, you know, call a duck a duck, but it used to be once upon a time that non-alcoholic beers were for the people with a problem with alcohol. That mm-hmm. is no longer true. We just talked about that. Uh, and and yeah. if you don't remember what we talked about, rewind this and start over. Um, this is also uh, th- this is also, uh, or I'm sorry, the other myth we have is, well, non-alcoholic beer doesn't have alcohol to, as a preservative. So therefore it's dangerous. We can get sick off of stuff. Well, th- that is true, but people have learned how to manage that. And if you doubt what I'm saying right now, if you doubt Megan nodding her head in agreement, then go to your grocery store and look at all the canned chili, the canned soup, the processed foods, and 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 tell me we haven't figured out that problem. Right? Is, is, yeah. is all this fair? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, I think there's just some, maybe some block that we're just a little bit behind. We Just like we were, you know, when mass domestic beer was the the primary means of drinking beer in the United yep. States in the 80s and 90s, you know, and there was only 1,700 breweries in the U.S. And then we quickly caught on to the fact that there were better options, yeah. that it could be made safely, that it could be made with high quality, with a, with a diverse range of offerings. And there were laws that needed to be changed in order to make that happen. And I, I see the same opportunity here, Jeremy. And to your point, I think as a person who abstains from alcohol, my own experiences led me to see that, that that there wasn't a readiness level in the market to help me as a consumer. I would go to places and experience that stigma a lot. Like, hey, do you have guys have any beer? I'm in this amazing beer bar with like 80 beers on draft and there's nothing for me. And I could only get a water, or like an Arnold Palmer, <laughs> which, you know, whatever. And like, yeah. you know, I just, I was always felt like you're missing an opportunity to, to be, uh, you know, to serve that need. And, um, and, and then as it relates to food safety, I think that that was another, that Dr. Keith Via really pushed me to create aficionado based on that. He was like, there needs to be more knowledge, almost on the cautionary side, like as craft brewers inevitably recognize they have to have these things, how do we teach them to make it safely? Because to your exact point, we're now dealing with a beverage that's being made in a facility that makes alcoholic beverages with yeast and fermentation precursors mm-hmm. and everything. 
um, to make something that doesn't have the micro, you know, the microbial protections that ethanol provides. So how do you do that? Which is, a, which is why we focused a lot on that. A lot of the articles I've been asked to write, and we're writing an article for Zymergy right now on how to homebrew it safely, right? Yeah. That's the questions that people have, which to just, it's just education and application of that knowledge, because exactly what you said, this is just a food safety uh, issue or a, uh, a stigma associated issue with things that we believed to be true um, before really the consumer demanded to have more options and the market was forced to serve it. And, and, and you, uh, you landed the plane much better than I did because really what this is for people who, who make money in the beer industry, who are, who are bean counters in the uh, beer industry, this non-alcoholic uh, thing is, is, is just uh, pure opportunity. It's pure opportunity yes. and what you've created with aficionado and you didn't pay me to say this, but it, it allows people who are trying to take advantage of this opportunity to understand their product, understand the objections like, Oh, I'm not alcoholic. Oh, that, Oh, that's not safe. You know, you, know, you have to understand this stuff and then you can sell it. And then you can create this experience we talked about. And then, and then everyone can drive home and do it again tomorrow. And maybe even for breakfast, there's no alcohol, take it on a plane. Right. I don't care. You know, <laughs> um, to, uh, to kind of bring this to a close, I've got a few different questions and you can answer them as you see fit. But, um, but because you answered the, uh, my normal questions last time around, I've got some different questions for you. Um, but the word on the street is you have a lot of the younger generations entering the drinking culture and they're not doing it the same way I did when I was young a billion years ago when it was uh, when it was all on and all off. Uh, you know, I, I still see I still have visions of of uh, people doing keg stands because that was cool way back then. Right. Uh, don't get me started. Um, but you have these younger generations now that are. I don't know if it's trepidation or curiosity. I'm not quite sure what it is, but they, but they're not drinking as much alcohol as my generation did. What do you have to say to them uh, as guidance as they enter alcohol, alcohol free? What do you, what do you have to say to them? Yeah. Well, I think the, what we, the data is pretty clear that they are still drinking, but they're drinking less and they drink premium because they grew up differently when they, than we did. So I'd say to them, like, tell us old geezers like to get to get over it already like that we live in a time of te there's technology available in from chat gpt and open ai and our ability to communicate and innovate um i think we're only at the, the tip of that iceberg of what you and i will see jeremy in the remainder of our life on earth um is that there's that the the conventions that we used to hold in a post covid world are, are are everything we thought we knew is probably wrong. And to begin to assume that we know that young people are going to want to do the same things we did is, is wrong because um, there's just so much more information available to them to make those choices. And we just didn't have that. It was, I mean, what else, what was your other choice than to do the keg stand? I mean, it was not like we were being <laughs> educated on this and there were no, there was even, wasn't even a no duels really option for us at that time. Cause beer, was, so cause I, beer wasn't for tasting. It was for consuming and mass. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and that gets into why we hold these, these current beliefs that we still yeah. do. So I would, I'm very encouraged by this younger generation, you know, I, I'm like the Kristen Bell of the world. I allowed my children, um, uh, in, under supervision to sip non-alcoholic beer Same and here. taste it and know, and know what mom does. And because I want to reduce the stigma, I mean, how amazing would it have been for me to go to the pub with my dad at 18 and see that it wasn't about just getting drunk, but I could sit with my dad and have a beer it was just a beer with under under a half percent alcohol, which other frankly would be less to than if I would have a glass of orange hole. juice and uh, or make out of a loaf of bread and on my counter, counter, all of which have over a great drink, ABV, and no matter what the a non-alcoholic beer. Mm. So I think just something as simple as that knowledge allows people to um, make different choices. And I think as it relates to that need to alter ourselves, there are and will continue to be different options for people outside of these conventional options at a rate that we probably can't even, you know, can't even really understand now. But for now, it's kind of alcohol and cannabis as an emerging replacement. And AFNA just sort of sitting in the background for the taking, like, okay, now that everybody is going to understand um, what these substances can do to, to you, 
um, how do we, how can we integrate these other beverages to keep the ritual whole and uh, make great drinks and connect and over a great drink, no matter what the ABV is or beverage in your glass. Um, and that's really like to me what the exciting thing is that I, I would imagine that we'll see more openings in, in CPG firms to launch and run new and emerging brands that serve this need um, than ever before and less and less of the traditional, which again, as a utopian visionary is an exciting, uh, an exciting thing to contemplate and certainly keeps me feeling like I want to stay in the industry and keep flying this flag because um, for me, moderation and mindful drinking and adopting an alcohol-free lifestyle is um, my comeback story. It's part of my transformation. It was such a unique and gratifying experience to um, uh, to beat and win something that a problem that had been holding me back from unfolding my potential. And um, I think the younger generation just may be a little bit more wise to those uh, to those types of concepts than perhaps we were when we were doing keg stands in college. <laughs> well, and they have people <laughs> like you to uh, teach them that. And if I remember from the conversation last time, uh, when you stopped drinking alcohol, not only did you get your life back, but you got a incredibly much sweeter life out of it. Uh, and yeah. judging by the incredible year you've had that apparently that just keeps going. And, yeah. um, and so it, it just really speaks to mindful drinking, whether you're mindfully tasting this wonderful Belgian golden strong or being mindful about your choices in, in drinking, uh, one of my favorites, the Cerveza Atletica from, uh, athletic brewing. Mm -hmm. it, it's just, uh, again, they didn't pay me to say that. Um, it's just, you can choose your life. You <laughs> can choose your life choose well yeah right that's right that's right choose well and and, and sip with enjoyment yes. right no matter what's no matter what's in the glass yeah. i love that jeremy and I, i've just so enjoyed your um curiosity and desire to spread the word about the moderation movement i i wish all of your i hope all of your drinkers get a chance to try some great things in dry january even if you're just curious about it i think every year you're going to continue to find new offerings that just uh, delight the palate, you know, and at a minimum that we're, you know, you and I are all about that. And at the at best to improve somebody's life and give them the opportunity to maximize their potential. If, if that indeed is how this will come to fruition for them is, is, uh, is like, why? Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay. Some, uh, quick questions. I've asked you this before. I want to see if it's changed. Megan, why does good beer matter to you or good non-alcoholic beer matter to you? Yeah. Uh, good beer matters to me because it empowers how we connect over the drink and I beer um has been my pathway and the the journey I have walked to um cultivate those experiences for myself but for many others because I've had a position of influence to to do that been blessed to run major education programs for for very large very large breweries and what I learned was at the end of the day like you know you became this uh, this kind of interesting person by by being involved with the beer industry. You could all be sitting next to a neurosurgeon. They'd want to know more about your job than, than their own, you know? Yeah, and and I, I think, and I think for me that, that that's why I think there's something very, um, very curious to people about ha cultivating these experiences and sharing and a good beer matters because that's sort of, that it, it is in our DNA. It is in our, in our history to have these these beverages at the table as we enjoy our our life on this earth and share those times together and without getting too deep into the spiritual philosophy and nature of those questions it invokes something in our heart and i think when our heart and mind can be connected um especially through beer which i think is a really nutritional and beautiful beverage but also through afna wine afna spirits um I, I, you know beverages of that nature we can live better and we can make new connections in a way that we haven't experienced before. Well said. Uh, what's the website one more time for anyone who wants to find it and learn more? Yes, uh, alcoholfreeaficionados with an S dot com. And we're also on LinkedIn. So check out our LinkedIn page. We're pretty active on there. It's just uh, LinkedIn uh, backslash uh, aficionados. 
um, you can get to our page from there. And uh, I, I really would encourage people to check that out, join into the conversation and don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, personally for with anybody that might have questions about the program or is just sober curious or has questions about any beer. I, I like you really like to talk about it. So I'm happy to happy to do that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you coming on yet again, taking your time. As anyone can see, or if you're, if you're not watching, you, you, you probably heard that you're actually talking to me from your car because you're such a busy mom, entrepreneur, uh, uh, wife. <laughs> uh, it's just like you're, you're talking from your car because you're on the go. Thank you for spending the time with me, with us. Um, obviously I think this is also a very important subject. So I, I, I'm glad that you shared it with everyone and I, I hope to get it out there. Um, for all the reasons that we just spent the last hour talking about it, there's, there's so many reasons why we need to understand this. And, and so I just appreciate it. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming on again. Yeah. Same. Thanks, Jeremy. Best of luck to you. And I look forward to talking to you about all the new future opportunities you will in- inevitably uncover. So, so thank you for this show and, uh, and inviting me back. And um, thank you to all the listeners out there that are interested in this stuff. It's, it's wonderful to share it with you. So cheers and look forward to talking to you again yeah, soon. Cheers. In this final episode, I want to thank all the guests who came on the show to share their stories and their experiences. And I want to thank all of you who have listened. At this point, I'm pressing pause on the Good Beer Matters podcast because I've said what I was compelled to say. Now I want to take Good Beer Matters in other directions. It's not goodbye forever, just goodbye for now. So consider this the end of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. There are more stories to tell and great beers to be experienced, but for now, the rest of this journey is yours. I would love to hear what stories resonated with you the most and what you're doing to make beer culture even better. Don't forget to grab a beer, hang out with your friends, and let your world open up. Thank you for listening all these years. Cheers.